My name is Tara Wick. I'm a community partner at the Colorado Trust, and I would like to welcome all of you to the webinar, Connecting Rural Colorado Communities with Emerging Market Dynamics, State Initiatives, and Opportunities to Think and Collaborate Regionally with Dr. Stefan Weiler, the Director of the Regional Economic Development Institute, otherwise known as REDI, at the Colorado State University, and his fellow professors at REDI, Don um, Thelmany McFadden and Becca Le uh, Jablonski. This webinar is the first in a six-part rural development learning series, which will take place over the next two weeks. The series is sponsored by resident teams in the communities of Antonito, Avondale, Dove Creek, Olathe, San Luis, and Sawatch in partnership with the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center and the Colorado Trust. Each of these communities has an organized team of residents who have committed thousands of hours over the last two years to identifying and analyzing their community's most pressing issues and are developing community health equity plans to address these issues at the roots. Each resident team has identified the issue of depressed economic conditions in their rural communities as a root cause issue, one that especially affects children and the non-college bound young people in their communities. Communities have recognized that depressed economic conditions are intrinsically bound with social disconnection and systems of discrimination that often play out along race and class lines. Residents know that building their power, especially the power of those most affected by the issues, to advocate for their community's future will be an important part of any solution. These webinars were designed to connect resident teams to statewide experts working on solutions to Colorado's rural economic development challenges and to inspire thinking and conversation at a local and regional level. Recordings of these webinars will be made available to the Colo on the Colorado Trust website for later viewing. A number of resident teams plan to invite community residents, local elected officials, and other partners to view and discuss these webinars together. The webinars will be interpreted and the material will be translated into Spanish in the coming weeks. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Stefan Weiler. Um, and his team. Stefan holds the William E. Morgan Endowed Chair as Professor of Economics at Colorado State University. He received his Bachelor's in Economics and Master's in Development Economics from Stanford University in 1988 and his Economics PhD from the University of California in Berkeley in 1994. For three decades, Stefan's research, teaching, and mentoring has spanned a variety of development and labor market issues in Africa, Appalachia, Europe, and the American West. His current work focuses on regional economic growth and development, particularly in rural and inner city areas. He was the founding research director of the Colorado Innovation Report and is the current director of the Regional Economic Development Institute at Colorado State University, where he and his partners provide fresh, timely, and cutting-edge information to enhance economic growth and development prospects for regions across the globe. And it is now, without further delay, let's begin the presentation. Stefan, Don, and Becca, welcome, and thank you. Thanks very much, Tara. We're going to try to hit a few highlights here. It's a, it's a very large topic, something the three of us have been studying for a combined oh, 50 or 60 years or so, and we still have yet to really scratch the surface. Um, so we'll try to share a little bit of what we've learned and understood um, and hit upon a few themes that we hope uh, might be broadly useful to the communities in particular that, uh, that have been supporting this kind of work. Um, the Regional Economic Development Institute of Colorado State is, is relatively new. You can take a look at our website. Um, the, the graphics in this presentation were done by us, but we also want to give a, a special appreciation to uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gardner and the State Demography Office, from which we've actually taken quite a few of these, particularly um, demographic and, and social indicator slides. So, hang on. Okay, there we go. All right, ready, like I said, at CSU, what you're going to hear a few of the themes that we've been working on since we were created about a year ago. And we're focusing on the economics of rural and urban areas, and we're thinking about them together. Um, often rural and urban are seen as isolated, of, of, being, of being separated. The rural-urban divide is a, is a concept that we've been talking a lot about. And we actually think that there's a lot of reasons to think that they can be uh, much more collaborative. There's partnerships that I think are win-wins for both types of areas. Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that they're surprisingly entrepreneurial, that rural areas are surprisingly entrepreneurial in ways that I think urban areas can really benefit from. So our general aim is to provide timely, relevant, multidisciplinary, engaging analysis of the most pressing, pressing issues in regional development, many of which are occurring in rural areas. So we'll give you a quick outline of where we're heading in the next sort of 45 minutes or so. 
Um, we're going to first talk about who is rural, uh, the demographics and why they matter. It talks particularly about population related job growth and then the, the power of in migration. Then we'll talk about this, the, the economics driving rural areas, where the, where the earnings come from, um, traditional sectors like ag and mining. Um, talk about the role of education, the new role of, and maybe the actually slightly older role of, of gigs in the gig economy and where, and how those create, end up creating jobs. And then we'll, we're going to come back to that concept of the rural urban divide. And the fence is that there really is, there's a reality to this is we're, we're going to take most of our examples from Colorado, um, but throughout the United States, there are some real differences between rural and urban areas, particularly in terms of their economic trajectories, where they're heading. Um, and that's something that I think we can, I think communities like your own um, can actually play a real role in, in, in changing that trajectory and, and making the possibilities even greater than they are now. And I think part of the idea is what we'll try to pitch to you towards, particularly towards the end of this, is thinking about region as complements rather than competitors. That rural and urban areas can work together. That rural areas, that rural communities can work together. That the sum is greater than, it's, than the parts. Um, rural has a lot of different advantages. We'll talk about these a little bit later, but rural actually has by its nature, there are some, some features that rural areas have that make them have, give them some real economic advantages. They generally lower cost. They generally have amenities that urban areas don't have, such as access to recreation, to the outdoors. And the fact is that they are just as able to tap into the global market as any other, as any other community, thanks to the uh, innovations in information technology or IT. And so the sort of overall theme is to, me, to, to leverage those assets that communities actually already have, to think about the advantages they already have, and to use the folks that are already there in terms of the folks who are already being entrepreneurial in their communities, to think more strategically about the ways, possibilities going forward. Okay, who is rural? Now these are all the rural, most of the United States, actually most of these are, these are all the counties in the United States. And um, the ones that are in white are all the what are known as metropolitan areas. Okay, non-metropolitan areas are counties which have counties which have a core city of less than fifty thousand people. All right, and as you'll notice, that most of the counties in the United States are based on towns of less than fifty thousand people. Um, and what you'll notice is that the great majority of uh, great majority of of counties um, population change um, is negative has been negative in the 1990 to 2014. So people, have, so these counties have actually been losing people over that 25 year span. So the orange and the red are the areas that have been losing population. The ones in green um, are the ones that have been gaining population, even if only very little. And if you'll notice, if we're, we're gonna focus most of this on Colorado, and you'll notice that actually surprisingly relative to the rest of the rural United States, many Colorado, rural Colorado communities have actually been gaining uh, have actually been gaining population. A lot of them, as you'll notice in the mountains and in the western slope, that's a feature that we will that will show up several times. The ones that have been struggling more are the ones on the eastern plains. Um, now, where, where does this population growth come from? Well, population growth largely mirrors employment growth. And here, there's slightly fewer places in green, uh, excuse me, in, in orange and red. But, um, and you'll notice that even, even that Colorado rural communities are even stronger in terms of employment growth. But again, it's a question of the Western slope, which has tended to see higher employment growth relative to the Eastern Plains, which has had, uh, which has had some pockets of growth, of employment, of job growth, but, um, even, but still several places that have actually saw net decreases in jobs over 25 years. So what we're gonna do is take a, a, a somewhat more, uh, careful look at the types of non-metropolitan counties. Again, metropolitan counties are those with 50,000, those are counties with 50,000, core, core towns of 50,000 or more. So if you take a look at Colorado, um, it's all the counties along the Front Range from, from Fort Collins down to Pueblo. And then the recent, relatively recent issue in the early 2000s of Grand Junction and Mesa County out on the Western Slope, because Grand Junction has now grown to past 50,000. But I think there's been an interesting distinction that they that uh, the census office started using to differentiate types of rural counties. It's not all rural counties, as as you folks know out there, are, are the same. And they created a subsection of of non-metropolitan counties known as micropolitan counties. These micropolitan counties have have centers of 10 to 50,000. And as we know, those are actually pretty big towns in many in these places for a lot of rural America. So they're based on a small micro type of city as opposed to a metro type of city. And those, those micropolitan cities 
are actually fairly important, and you'll notice that they're actually quite distinct from rural counties. Metropolitan counties, again, are in Colorado are the front range along with Mesa County Grand Junction in the Western Slope, but the micro, micropolitan counties are ranging everywhere from Durango and La Plata up to Fort Morgan and Morgan County, um, Fremont County, Fremont County with Canyon City and so on. Um, and so we will use this distinction um, to talk about a little in a little more detail the prospects for for rural counties. Well, we will use the analysis because of the data. We uh, 2005 was the uh, was the definition that we're going to use. Um, two new micropolitan areas were added in 2015. This isn't surprising. The fact is that some places that are growing relatively quickly will what they call graduate in some sense to micropolitan status. Those places that have perhaps had um, had, had core cities of less than 10,000 sprinted over the course of the uh, intervening 10 years. And therefore, um, you now have two new micropolitan areas um, based not surprisingly on Steamboat Springs and creating the Steamboat Springs Craig uh, micropolitan area. And then as well as Glenwood Springs, creating uh, the Edwards Glenwood Springs and Eagle Counties as well. Adding to Montrose, Durango, Fort Morgan, Sterling, Canyon City, um, Breckenridge, Lake and Pitkin, okay? But we, we will go back and use these definitions, again, um, the older definitions, because we have a little more time frame to, to assess how that, how those micropolitan versus rural counties had fared. So here on the first slide, you'll notice this comes from the State Demography Office. And you know, where are the people and where is the pro projected population change? Well, not only is the vast concentration of population uh, in the front range, it's also where it's likely to grow the most. I mean, you will see the, the, the communities and the, and the counties along the front range being particularly strong performers in terms of pro pro projected population over the next 35 years. Some rural counties are going to grow uh, on, these are again, absolute increases over the next 20, excuse me, next 35 years. And you'll notice that Mesa County, for instance, another metropolitan area, Grand Junction, but also some of the Western Slope counties, Route, Eagle, Summit, Garfield, um, Montrose, and so on, La Plata, Montezuma. Again, Western Slope is doing relatively better than the, than the Eastern Plains. Eastern Plains on, are expecting basically zero growth in many, many places, and in some cases, continuing their population declines. What drives population growth? Population growth comes, comes in two flavors, basically, two, two components. One is natural increase, births minus deaths. That doesn't tend to change very much over time. What does tend to change a lot, and particularly in a state like Colorado, is net migration. And we will take a look at exactly what that net migration means in terms of areas. But what you'll notice is, particularly for younger folks, what a lot of, what a lot of communities are looking for is in migration by younger, usually well-educated people. And what you'll notice is that <clears throat> the under 20, actually, that mimics a lot of, when you're under 20, you're usually moving with your parents. So what's happening, for example, in the under 20s is they're largely, those are largely following the 40 to 60s. The key demographic is this 20 to 40. And you'll notice that metropolitan areas, even accounting for the fact that they have more residents, this is a rate of, of in-migration, that the metropolitan areas in Colorado are, are, are pulling in people, largely educated people at a very high rate. And you'll notice that now this is also gives you a first sense of why splitting micropolitan and rural counties is important here. Because rural counties, places that have core cities of less than 10,000 are not pulling in many people. Yet micropolitan counties where you have secondary cities that are actually, that provide some of the amenities, some of the services without all of the costs of metropolitan areas are actually doing a remarkably good job of pulling in people of the 20 to 40 year group. So, Let's take a look at this in two different ways. One, we'll see the percent born in Colorado. And this is a feature of a little bit of, in, of the, the feature of what immigration has done is that the Eastern Plains is where a lot of people haven't been moving into. So the percent born in Colorado in the Eastern Plains is very high. Whereas in, on the Western Slope, um, it is much, much lower. But moved to Colorado within the last year. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of what are the counties that are really attracting people. And here the, the map is, is interesting in the sense that, yes, you have places like Boulder, um, El Paso County with Colorado Springs, but you also have Montezuma, La Plata, Archuleta down in the southwest corner, San Miguel, which is near with Telluride, Rio Blanco, uh, 
Washington County as well. Um, even in the Eastern Plains, you are having some places like Sedgwick as well that are actually pulling in places, Arapahoe County, Elbert County also, um, that, are, that are attracting people um, to move into their communities. We don't need, you folks know this better than we do, uh, even after studying it for 50 years, um, economies vary hugely by place. It's the fact that they vary hugely by place that I think it matters, that the economics of place actually really matters. Because it's not, places aren't the same, and they continue on, on particular trajectories that seem to be very much their own. What we, what we talk about in economics are regional economic drivers. And the big driver, what's commonly known as sort of an export industry is, if you think about your region as a little island, bringing dollars into your region by selling goods and services to the outside is one big way of bringing money into your, into your area, of driving the local economy. And traditionally that's been done with ag, for instance, and mining, um, particularly in, in many of the rural areas of Colorado. But another sort of somewhat more subtle economic driver is keeping dollars in the region because for a lot of goods and services, people have to go outside also by, by the internet by, by, having to, by having to get goods and services from outside their community. And what that does is it drains, it leaks dollars out of the region. And so equally importantly in many ways to bring dollars into the region is keeping the dollars in the region, of, of figuring out where the gaps are, where people are spending money outside and being able to provide those goods and services locally. The fact is that, for, as with a lot of industries, um, traditional ag and mining drivers aren't the entire future. They can't be. Um, all areas, metropolitan and rural, are diversifying beyond these historic sectors. It's, we've, you know, we've gone beyond, even in some cases, beyond manufacturing to a largely service-oriented sector. There are many high-wage, high-value high service jobs, from architects to engineers to accounting, that sort of um, financial services, um, but this, this diversification has been occurring throughout the United States, but in some ways has been hitting rural areas particularly hard because ag and mining have been so historically linked to their places. Um, and one of the themes that we're going to come back to is that homegrown entrepreneurship, there's already a lot of entrepreneurs in your communities, probably more than you actually realize. It's one of the things that surprised us when we were looking at rural counties, is that homegrown entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, the people have been operating below the ra radar, help reveal existing strengths. There's a lot of places, there's a lot of strengths that already exist in your communities, and you may not have to go very far to find them. The reality is that Unlike ag and mining, where you used to have maybe one big sector or one big company that would, would support an entire area, one big smokestack savior is unlikely to show up to replace those. That's simply the reality of the situation. But the fact is that what the reality is that what's, rural areas are going to follow urban areas in the sense that there's going to be a lot more micro businesses, a lot of people working for themselves, what we call non-employers. And we'll get into that momentarily. But briefly, what we want, so here's a, here's a, here's a, quick snapshot of taking of, of where these sources of earnings come from. I mean, so what are these economies? Where do, where do people in metro, micro, and rural counties get their money? Well, as you'll notice that, yes, rural areas have a particularly high dependence on agriculture and mining. That's historic. It's been decreasing, but the fact is it's still there. And less so for micropolitan and even less so for metropolitan areas, obviously. Metropolitan and micropolitan areas are much more specialized in tech information and management, which tend to be higher wage and higher value. Um, entertainment and recreation is also a big feature for micropolitan and rural areas. It's part of what makes them also attractive. It's part of what creates their amenities. Manufacturing is actually declining as a part of the United States economy. It's most important in rural areas, less so for the others. The real, the, the, the sweet spot in some ways are those other services. A huge number of other services are, exist in all areas. And that's where a lot of the entrepreneurial activity that already exists and is likely to be created is going to go on and that's true of every area and that's just as true of metropolitan counties as it is of micropolitan and rural counties. So this is Don Filmini and I'm just taking over here for a couple of slides to reinforce kind of a, a topic Stefan already brought up is beyond rural counties just you know nationally across all counties the agricultural share of value added and job growth is going down across time um, a couple things to note there, though, is a, a couple things Stefan already pointed out might tell a slightly different story. This is the ag share value added with ag being measured very traditionally in terms of farm gate, sales of crops, livestock, and so forth. But in some of that recreation and um, tourism and professional service 
growth that you saw on the past slide, it may just be that agriculture is turning into what we now call food systems, where whether it's small scale food manufacturing, agritourism, heritage tourism, or um, even people understanding that they can do something as simple as host hunters or hikers on their site, we also might see that some of that entrepreneurship, particularly in rural areas, where agriculture has been historically, is showing up as a new kind of job and a new type of innovation. So even though these numbers show ag is shrinking as a share of value-added job growth, it may be masking the fact that some of that, that those sectors we don't measure well because they haven't historically been things we collect data on, may in fact be linked to the agriculture and food system. So as you see in this graph, that's partly driven by the fact that we, on the left-hand side, see that the number of farms has shrunk drastically in this country. And even though this graph shows we're at a very, very small number of farms, if you really dig deeper into the USDA data, if you take out those farms that are quite small, i.e. less than 50 acres, less than $100,000 in sales, it would even be one-tenth of what you see there. And what, what's been driving this is the fact that to be in the global market uh, where the commodities are, you have to be of quite large scale compared to what you used to. This shows that our average acreage is 500. But again, if you looked at the truly commercial farms, that would be more like 2,000 average farm size. But again, what this mask is that there's a whole new um, cadre of small entrepreneurial farms who maybe aren't going to need the land base, are not competing in global commodity markets, and instead are going after the model Stefan mentioned before of trying to keep local dollars in the system either through food or food manufacturing or tourism. The other part is mining and extraction. Um, and that's been, a, like agriculture, it's been a base for a, a lot of communities throughout Colorado, throughout the Western United States as well. Uh, part of my history goes back to West Virginia and mines back there when I was doing work there 25 years ago. And this is the boom bust cycle. This is Colorado in the United States. Um, we based it on the 1969 data. And what you'll notice is that mining and extraction um, swings a lot. Uh, and that has typically been true over the last, over the last you know, 50 years or so. Um, the number of jobs that are occurring, uh, in fact, uh, are overall are actually on the decrease. Um, but in particular, it also tends to be very volatile. Prospects for non-oil and gas mining in particular, and this is, you know, for example, coal areas, um, oil and gas, you know, do spike up and down, particularly with the advent of fracking, there is, in fact, new, new opportunities for oil and gas. Um, but the prospects for other types of mining, and particularly, for example, coal mining, has been declining pretty precipitously. Um, we're now down at a level about half of where we were in 1969, and we're heading, as you can tell, in that same direction. So the idea is that agriculture and mining are changing dramatically. And in terms of employment prospects, there are some niches, um, but in terms of being an overall big sector for counties and communities to depend on, it's becoming increasingly difficult to deal to, to use those as the bases. So what is the future? Well, one of the things um, that we tend to, to look at is what, we, what economists call human capital or basically education. And that tends to be particularly important when you're trying to figure out, okay, which places are going to grow and which places are going to stagnate. This is a question that all communities are trying to, trying to understand. And one of the most basic features is in fact human capital and education. The pla places that, this is, this is tracking average employment growth between 1990 and 2014 over a 25 year span basically. And what you'll notice is that places that have more, high, more people with high school diplomas, more people with bachelor's degree, more people with, with advanced degrees will tend to grow more quickly. But with places that have more, that more people with less than a high school diploma, they, in fact, their employment growth prospects are, are weaker, okay? And that's a harsh reality in a lot of cases, um, but it also it again makes it important to think about, okay, what will make in a community attractive for keeping young people or bringing people, young, young people in who are educated, who come to places like CSU and are thinking about new places to move thereafter. Urban areas do have more highly educated residents. Um, Colorado is known to have a very highly educated populace 
ranks first, second, or third, depending on the measure that you use in the United States. It is largely a metropolitan phenomenon. Metropolitan areas have over 40% of their population with the DA or higher. But note that micropolitan and rural areas aren't that wildly far behind. It's, they're around 30% themselves. But some, in particular, not only are they not far behind as a group, but there are some places that have particular concentrations. This is taking a look at the most recent American Community Survey data present bachelor's degree or higher. And what you'll notice is that there are, in fact, many communities, again, more on the western slope than on the, than on, than on the eastern plains. But even on the eastern plains, there are some, some standouts which have places, which have, do have concentrations where um, bachelor's degrees are more numerous. This is, this is the reality. This is of the recovery from the Great Recession. The job growth index, if you start with 2006, which is before the, the Great Recession hit, you'll notice that what happened is that we got some increase uh, right until into the Great Recession, and then all areas, metropolitan, micropolitan, and rural areas all dropped off. What you'll notice, though, is that, in fact, while metropolitan areas have come well back beyond the levels of 2006, the 10% their, their employment levels are now 10% greater than they were before. Micropolitan areas are just getting back to where they were, and rural areas have been, have been stagnating and, and having a hard time. They've been struggling to create the kind of jobs to get them back to where they were even, even 10 years ago. So here's another, here's another map to give a better sense of this, though. So the places in red and orange are places that have had, you know, have, have basically lost jobs <clears throat> And yellow have lost jobs as well, but not as not as badly. What you'll notice is a lot of the state is in is in yellow, orange, and red, um, and some and some communities have got, gotten hit fairly hard. Um, the metropolitan areas have done relatively well, but there are even some surprises in terms of the uh, the, the rural areas. Castillo, for example, has actually gained jobs relatively. Um, Phillips County has also gained jobs. So those are interesting cases, which makes you wonder, you know, what, what exactly were those folks doing right? Those are sometimes a good way of thinking about communities that you may want to contact and sort of figure out what, what exactly worked in terms of their job growth. So how do we grow jobs? Well, as it turns out, um, one of the things that people, what we surprised us too is that we usually think about you know Google and IBM and being big big employers. Those are the ones that create jobs. Actually, the share of jobs created by young companies, almost all of which have ten or fewer employees, so these are really small businesses, create well over half the jobs in the United States. And that's I think a surprising statistic for a lot of people. That basically it's not the big companies that are creating the jobs; it's the small ones, it's the entrepreneurial ones. They're the ones that are creating the big number of jobs. And again, most of these are workplaces with less than. 10 employees. So it doesn't, you don't have to be a big company. And the part that's really interesting is that if you take a look, even a place relative to a place like California, the share of jobs created by small companies and young companies in particular, California, yes, is above the national average. That's, that's the, the bread bars. But you'll notice that relative to California, even California, the growth engine, Colorado has a particularly strong reputation of getting more jobs out of young businesses. And that I think is, is really noteworthy. So who are these folks? Well, we termed it uh, in one of our earlier reports, we've, uh, one of our ready reports, which is a feature, uh, featured in, and are available on our website. We, we talk about micro entrepreneurs and those are basically, these are small entrepreneurs, people just starting their businesses with just themselves, a partner, or maybe just a few employees. And if that's a, that is a key distinction. Most people talk about companies having employees, but the vast majority of businesses out there have no employees. They're basically self-employed proprietors, people who own their own businesses. They're what we call broadly non-employers. And they're by far the fastest growing establishments. It's not the employers themselves, it's the people who are just starting their own businesses. Um, there's been a real focus on the gig economy, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But um, the fact is that a lot of <laughs> the gig economy's always been around. It's been around for the entire history of the Republic. Self-employed contractor gigs has been the norm for a lot of folks for a long time. Everything from construction to tax service to stylists to consulting, all of these folks have been doing you know, gigs, working on their own, self-employed, their own businesses, not hiring anyone until they really need to. Um, so the trend has basically been for these non-employers and as well as smaller employer establishments. Once you do hire employees, you no longer need an HR department. You no longer need an accounting department. 
you basically could operate a business on a much smaller scale very efficiently because of information technology. Um, you can do accounting and human resources very easily now uh, via software or outsourcing, which is another source of non-employer businesses. Um, and even something as massive as manufacturing, it's manufacturing itself has become a micro employer, a micro entrepreneur, because now you have 3D fabrication, which is basically just one person with software creating manufacturing output, which is something that we couldn't have conceived of. Getting back to our basic point is 75% of all business establishments are non-employers. So that's the, that's the big, when you think about, when you think about the employment structure and, and businesses, that's, the, that's the, the hidden part of the iceberg. What everybody sees are the employers, that's the top of the iceberg. But the bottom, the underneath part of the iceberg is everybody who's working on their own. And so 75% of all business establishments represent those non-employers. Interestingly though, so, but that's also the basis from where employers come from. Play, no, successful non-employers, eventually them and their partners can't manage everything. So they eventually start hiring employees. That's where that job growth comes from. And from our statistics that basically 10 to 20% of non-employers become, of non-employers become employers. So they graduate and they become employers and start hiring new folks. Um, and 94% of employer births, in other words, when firms are started, you don't start a company with 100 people. You generally start with a few people, and that's where all the hiring comes from. And here's this chart just describing the difference in employer versus non, employer versus non-employer, quote unquote, gig establishments. And what you'll notice is that <clears throat> the dashed lines are Colorado, the solid lines are the U.S. And you'll notice the U.S. No, US non-employers and Colorado employers have just grown geometrically, basically, are, are, are just in less than what, in less than 20 years, have more or less grown by 50%, or employer establishments have barely grown by 10 and 20, 10 and 20% respectively. So non-employer establishments have already been a big part of the iceberg and they're only growing more important. Again, Colorado is uniquely entrepreneurial and dynamic. Um, we compared this with, we compared this with, uh, we compared this with, Excuse me. We compared this with um, oh, the gig economy. Um, we just got a we got a question online about the gig economy. The gig economy is basically that you work on single projects at a time. That you you, you work on gigs. So basically, your your job your job profile is basically I'm going to take on one project then another. Maybe take on multiple projects, but you take on gigs. So gigs is just a fancy term for projects. And I think a lot of you folks, I mean, you, when you're working in regular employment jobs, you, you take little gigs on and the fact is your employer is the one who gives you the gigs. Um, you create, when you're, in, when, you're, when you're in the gig economy, you create your own gigs. You go out and find them and you work on them. Okay, so thanks for the question. Um, and again, what it, we, 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 we're taking a look both non-employers and employers relative to the United States. And what you'll notice is that Denver, yes, as a metropolitan area is denser in terms of both non-employers and employers than the United States. But, but the fact is it's not just Denver, all of Colorado is more concentrated in terms of small businesses, both non-employers and employers of less than 50, of less than 500 than the US as a whole. Yeah, so anytime we show an index on the left-hand side like that, it's how we are compared to the US average. So it just be like a CPI, but it shows if we're at, 1.3, that means we're 30% more dense than the US average. So that's what that scaling means for those of you who maybe haven't seen a graphic like that before. Yeah, thank you. What we try to do here is when we're comparing Colorado to the rest of the US, it's US is a good benchmark. And Colorado generally, as you folks know, um, tends to rank really highly in all kinds of measures. And as it turns out, um, but that often is only in metropolitan areas, but as it turns out, particularly in entrepreneurship, as you'll notice that non-metropolitan areas, rural areas actually are featured very highly uh, in terms of their entrepreneurial abilities. Okay, this is a complicated slide that we basically will invite all of you to go back to at some point. Um, but what this does is it, what it does is it takes a look at sectors. Now, people are sort of wondering, okay, what kind of jobs are we talking about, okay? What this does is it gets at the different types of sectors, the different types of jobs, everything from finance and insurance to information and manufacturing. And these are the sectors, uh, these, are, these are concentrations of non-employers. So these are sectors that have more solo partner entrepreneurs and therefore also those that are likely to birth more employers. And the size, the size of the bubble is how big they are in Colorado. Um, the ones on the right, um, to the to the right hand side of the vertical axis, those are those are those are industries where Colorado is more concentrated than the U.S. 
as a whole. So we are more concentrated, not surprisingly, in real estate, construction, professional scientific and technical services, information, finance, insurance, and real estate, okay? Um, and the ones that are above the, the, the horizontal line, those are the ones that have been growing relatively quickly relative to the US. Okay, so what you'll notice is that a lot of our, most of our sectors have been growing faster than the US, but some in particular, and some have particularly high, these are average levels of sales for each one of these particular gigs. So the average gig in professional scientific and technical services generates $43,673 worth of annual sales okay and again this is meant to be a starting point for folks to take a look and get a better understanding of different kinds of sectors how they're growing in colorado generally and how concentrated they are relative to the united states so in other words what is what is where are we likely to go going forward it looks a lot like we're going to go forward in places that we are not surprised in information professional scientific and technical services construction real estate educational services art entertainment recreation and so on just to underscore the Colorado entrepreneurship, this is, you know, we were saying that IT makes management more efficient. Well, that also, we're taking a look at establishments with one to nine employees. And you'll notice that the growth in the United States, that's the red line. Um, United, we've, been, we've basically uh, grown by 50% relative um, to 1979, but Colorado, <clears throat> in terms of small businesses, one, ones that have one to nine employees, have been growing more, more than twice as fast. Again, small businesses in Colorado tend to thrive. And they also tend to create jobs. The other part that <clears throat> older companies that, <clears throat> younger companies tend to create jobs, older companies, as companies age, they will tend to start closing. And the fact is that Colorado is even more so than the United States. So if you take a look at age, age zero, basically when, when, a, when, a, when a company is born, um, it creates the, on, on average 10% more jobs than the United States, age one to five, also about 10%. But you'll notice as, as we get older that Colorado older companies tend to shed more jobs actually. Um, so again, this is this un underscoring sort of the young, the young and the strong in, in, in terms of entrepreneurial firms throughout Colorado, not just metropolitan, but also in rural Colorado. So who's helping to lead this dynamic? Well, interestingly, one of the features that actually has rural areas and have an advantage is that foreign born are more than twice as entrepreneurial as natives. And as it turns out, you'd think that most of these folks end up in, in metropolitan areas, but as it turns out, rural and particularly micropolitan areas, and particularly in Colorado, non-metropolitan Colorado has a lot of arrivals, has a lot of non-natives who are actually becoming entrepreneurs. And you'll notice that this is, again, in terms of the map, it's no longer the front range communities that are featured in, in blue, um, which are, tend to be the high, you know, the the places with high numbers, uh, in this case of percent foreign born, but places is extended from Garfield all the way out to Fort Morgan. Um, Prowers, Yuma, Phillips, for instance, Sawatch also. So there's a not large number of non-native entrepreneurial folks in these kind of communities, which is again, something I think an under-recognized and under-appreciated asset. Rural areas had a feature of the American history, American West of being pioneers. In a lot of ways, I, I, particularly in the West, I think they really still are. They are remarkably entrepreneurial. Um, there is some farm legacy, but only um, one six. Basically, the one, the one note that we started with was rural areas are on, more entrepreneurial than urban areas, and they are. Um, we'll show you that in the following statistic. And some people say, well, that's just, that's just farms, because farms, farms are entrepreneurial. Um, uh, only one sixth of rural establishments are farms, and and honestly, I you know the, the the farming heritage. I mean, farming is maybe perhaps the most entrepreneurial of all occupations. So in some ways, that rural heritage, that farming heritage, actually, I think it just helps boost the entrepreneurial abilities of rural areas. Um, even accounting for ag rural areas and more entrepreneurial. Cities are really surprised by this result. Probably rural areas aren't, but tech startups are not the norm for entrepreneurship. I mean, everybody talks about Silicon Valley. I grew up in the Silicon Valley, but that's, tech startups are by far not the norm in entrepreneurship. Um, on, you know, those other services that we were talking about earlier, there's a huge number of services that entrepreneurship is addressing. In some ways, rural areas have to be entrepreneurial. The big wage and salary employers are rare. It's hard to find somebody to give you a paycheck in rural areas, so you have to be entrepreneurial. If you want to find a job, you, have, you often have to create one. Towns and residents have figured out ways to find their niche. So let me, and he, let me just, so here's just to give you some confirmation. This is, you were just, I wanted to make the statistical point that entrepreneurship is more concentrated in non-metropolitan areas. And you'll notice 
both in the US, but in particularly in Colorado, that micropolitan, and yes, especially rural Colorado, um, entrepreneurship is higher in terms of non-farm residents per 100 people. So basically 30 out of every 100 people um, are entrepreneurs, 30 out of every, 30 out of every 100 employees are, are uh, non-farm proprietors are own their own businesses. Um, so almost a third in rural Colorado, much less in, in, in metropolitan Colorado. And the part that may be even more surprising is that rural businesses are also more resilient. The gold standard for, for resilience is the five-year survival rate. And we took a look at that over the Great Recession, which had a huge shakeout effect in both metropolitan and in rural, in rural counties. But what you'll notice is, even during this most turbulent period, the five-year survival rate of rural and micropolitan businesses were systematically higher in micropolitan and rural areas, which is a really remarkable feat. So in other words, they've, they've been more resilient. Not only are they more entrepreneurial, but they've also been more resilient, all right? So in any given year, you have up to 10% higher survival in rural communities. And the idea there is that the seedlings for the future are already likely in your or neighboring communities. The fact is that they're already there. They've already survived. They've already innovated. One of the things that people get worried about is like, well, small firms fail. And so therefore, shoot, I mean, then, you know, why should we worry about them? Well, as we just noted, bigger firms have a, a fail at an even greater rate and take down more jobs with them. And the reality is that job creation and destruction occur together. You get basically about a third from both births and closures. In other words, new forms, new, new businesses starting up and closing um, are, <clears throat> are, are responsible for about a third of job creation and destruction. And the fact is that places that have more births have more closures, um, but that is, that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, that means that the, the economy itself is highly dynamic, it's pioneering, it's trying out new things. And one of the more recent features of our research has shown that even accounting for all those closures with more births, uh, with, when you have more births, you do have more closures, but over the long term, places that have more births and closures have more long-term job growth. And it's like a seed bed, basically. If you, put, if you put out only a few seeds, then your chances of growing something really big are relatively small. But if you put out more seeds, yes, there will be more duds, but you've got a better chance of growing a Google, okay? And the fact is that the seeds actually interact with each other in many cases too. Entrepreneurs feed off of other entrepreneurs. So place, places that, you know, maybe even if one firm fails, it'll help the other folks keep going in another different sort of way. So in some ways, what you're doing, what each entrepreneur is doing is extending the innovator frontier. The entrepreneurs are really the conduits for the new ideas. And failure, although it's, it's difficult for any single company, failure is part of becoming a dynamic economy. And part of that longer term job growth is accepting sometimes that certain entrepreneurs fail. And the way we've done it in the past, in thinking about this, um, at, we, were, we <clears throat> helped start the uh, Colorado Innovation Network and particularly the, the, the uh, annual reports that it did. And in terms of coming up with innovation, we talked about, um, talked about innovation being an important and critical part of the growth process. And innovation is simply a product process or service that generates new value in the marketplace. And what most people focus on is ideas, talent, capital, all those kinds of things that you know, tend to happen a lot in, in metropolitan areas. But the fact is that even those raw innovations, even the best idea at CSU, always needs an entrepreneur. They need somebody who understands the market, can refine those raw innovations to identify, create, and maximize the market niche and value. Their entrepreneurs are the ones that connect innovation to the marketplace. They're the ones that make it work. And so in that sense, having those entrepreneurs in your community, the ones that are already going, they are in fact innovating. They are in fact coming up with ways to link to those markets. All right, so what about these folks? I mean, what, so what do you have? Uh, what do you have that you can, you can you know, potentially keep and, and attract entrepreneurs, particularly younger folks? Um, we talk a lot about regional assets. And assets are simply a, a fancy way of, of talking about regional strengths and opportunities. And they can come in a lot of different forms. We talked about human form, for example, human capital and educated young people, but also natural, <clears throat> natural amenities. Natural amenities are very important. Places that have, for example, a lot, lot more sunshine, places that have <clears throat> um, access to water, places in the mountains um, are all major natural amenity features that can keep and attract new people. And historic assets as well. History can be a very compelling asset. If you take a look at, you know, for example, um, Lodo, Denver, and Old Town Fort Collins, those are, they've based themselves on a, on a history, on a, a historical 
a bit of architecture on the old industries that are there, on reuse in terms of loss, in terms of new retail space. And those historic assets also have created real new niches. And that occurs in a lot, of, a lot of communities, not just in Fort Collins and in Denver. And those create niches. They create little places where, where there's a market opportunity. Now, any, small, any single small community may not have all of the features, all the assets that it might need. But that's where pooling and leveraging regional assets may be key. So in, the, in that sense, again, a regional sum of taking a look at, at not just yourself, but your neighbors. You're, you're thinking of yourself as a region. The regional sum of communities may be much greater than its parts. And you can create a complementary set of assets and niches. So maybe one place is nearby a lake while the other place has a historic downtown. Those are, those are complementary types of assets that can be used. Um, and the other part that I think that we're trying to do here at Ready, um, and with active participation like in this web webinar and with the Colorado Trust is not only to have rural communities think about themselves and their neighbors, but also innovate stronger connections to the urban core. Colorado is unusually well positioned for linkages. As folks who are along the front range know, place, prices are getting very high, especially for housing. Transportation is becoming a problem. There's a lot of people who would be certainly willing to consider um, living in alternative places, particularly nicer places, cheaper places, places, places <clears throat> with a certain level of goods and services, um, where they could actually do some of the activity that is currently occurring in Denver. And one of the one of the features that we've been really pleased by is that the Denver mayor, who we've been working with, has a real full is really fully endorsed this idea of trying to bridge the rural urban divide by by spreading. Denver's growth to the outlying areas because it's a win-win proposition for both areas. Taking one car off of I-25 is a big deal these days. Um, whereas that, that taking that one car off of I-25 can create potentially several jobs out in more rural areas. So what? Okay, one of the nice features about rural areas is the fact that they are small because entrepreneurship often can get lost in cities. People don't notice, right? But you can have real tangible impacts in smaller towns. People notice new businesses. People have, it's, it's part of the community fabric. Um, amenities matter, both natural and human. We talked about hills and mountains and coasts, lakes and rivers, but also history and culture. Part of that, you know, those, those, that combination can be obviously for tourism, but it's also, I think people, communities are beginning to realize that that is also a way, it's not only just for visiting tourists, but can attract and retain permanent residents. You know, old mining roads, for instance, can become, I used to be a mountain, a, a mountain trail runner. I used to spend a lot of time in Leadville. It's not only has a really great historic downtown, but has a tremendous number of trails leading right from the city downtown. So they've created the, the Mineral Belt Trail, which goes around the town, which people have been using with mountain bikes and others, and winter sports. Leadville is a neat example of using some of these assets to its advantage. Fact is that what you need to think about, what these communities that we've been working with, and as well as yours, hopefully as you're thinking about this, is emphasizing your niche, which is likely already there. The fact is that folks have already, your entrepreneurs, your communities already have a sense of what the possibilities are, partic particularly with an expansion towards information technology, broadband, and a Denver core that is looking for opportunities as well. What the, <clears throat> Well, Liz, Elizabeth Garner, who uh, we worked with extensively, she's been stressing, and we try to stress too, that there's a lot, lot more increasing numbers of what are known as location neutral businesses and employees. You don't need to be in a particular location. You need a lower scale of operation. All you need basically is a good broadband, uh, a good broadband connection. And this is true even in manufacturing now, where you're having sort of high tech 3D fab parts, fabrication parts being done, um, being manufactured in more rural locations. So the internet can make small towns can can make small towns really attractive locations, and those location neutral businesses employees, you know whether you're talking about a Wall Street firm looking for a place for its financial services representatives, their bond traders that work in Steamboat Springs, Steamboat Springs, and are really happy there. The internet can make small towns attractive locations for a lot of different types. In a lot of ways, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in California in the 1960s and 70s. I got to see Silicon Valley grow up. And Colorado reminds me a lot of California in the 70s and early 80s. Colorado, in a lot of ways, is the new California in terms of dynamism. It really, it, in a lot of ways, entrepreneurship was in California and is here now in Colorado, likely to continue to be the innovative job driver. The risks are really the ones that are beginning to crop up in mostly in urban, urban Colorado in terms of challenges, in terms of infrastructure and cost pressures. And in rural Colorado, they're having you know, growth growth 
uh, constraints, we were having trouble generating the kind of job growth. But in a lot of ways, those, those, two, those two challenges are complementary. The Denver metropolitan area is growing in some ways too quickly. That growth can spread out. The, also, the Colorado the front range is also the infrastructure and cost pressures. That can get itself spread out too. Both sides win. And again, Denver, the Denver mayor, Mayor Hancock, is an appreciated uh, advocate for spreading this growth. And this location-neutral entrepreneurship, this IT, um, we strongly believe there's already many examples of it, that the front range dynamism can flow to rural of Colorado, which is already entrepreneurial and can create complementary growth. So in terms of regional collaboration, when we're thinking about you know, rural communities themselves and rural to urban, what are we thinking about? We're talking about combined, uh, taking advantage of combined and leveraged assets, all right? So think about your community relative to others and what you can combine in terms of these assets. Increase the market scale. So in fact, if you have a local furniture store, for instance, it's, not, it's important not only to cater to your community, but possibly to neighboring communities as well. So the idea is that you're thinking about a larger market than just your community, but neighboring communities can create the kind of market scale, um, especially micropolitan areas, larger secondary towns that can create the kind of scale that you need. And then the linkages to larger urban markets. Um, Denver, Colorado is, is, is in a lot of ways is being seen as a pioneer in bridging the rural urban divide, that the two don't need to be separate. Western Colorado, for instance, um, in, excuse me, Eastern Colorado, or Eastern rural Colorado is relatively lower cost and very well connected in terms of broadband, in terms of roads, um, even to DIA. So those areas in rural Colorado actually have natural linkages to the front range. Western Colorado has tends to have relatively high amenities that makes it relatively attractive for entrepreneurs too. So just in those relatively simple ways, Colorado already in some ways has an advantage in bridging the rural urban divide. Uh, and again, you know, given the front range growth, and the fact that uh, the fact that the Colorado has um, rural communities that have already some built-in advantages, there's some real there's some real possibilities. So this is Don Thomany, and we're going to take over by providing a, li a little more examples, particularly in an area that, because we're the land grant, we have um, a lot of, of bandwidth to help, and a lot of work we've already done. Particularly, you've probably heard that the National Western Stock Show Center in Denver is very likely to be recreated in a number of ways with investments from the city of Denver, but also it will be our newest in experiment station for Colorado State University sometime within the next five to seven years. And that, of course, is going to showcase um, how food and agriculture can be one of these key linkages as a pioneering example. Beyond that National Western Center, if you've not heard, um, Cafe Reynolds Center for Engagement has some regional centers coming online. Um, in South Denver metro area and Sterling, Colorado, there's already a center and I believe one's coming online in Western Colorado in the near future. So beyond talking about where there should be this support and collaboration, Colorado State truly has made a new investment to actually put people out in the places that can help um, grease the wheels for some of that to happen. Specifically, one um, opportunity we want to highlight that's very current is the Colorado Blueprint for Food and Agriculture, where um, following up on a study that Cathay Reynolds and Greg Graff led um, less than five years ago, we wanted to go back out and take both a survey done for the Colorado Department of Agriculture on public attitudes about agriculture in Colorado. The value chain of Colorado agriculture from 2013 will be updated and out this year. And we actually did a series of regional and industry town halls over the last 12 months where we had communities themselves identify and inform us on eight major cross-cutting opportunities. I don't want to take the time to go through each of those, but I think you'd be hard pressed to not find something that's core to what each of your interest areas is that isn't included in this, in this grouping. And really one of our big innovations beyond um, connecting these three processes was we try to go all the way back to the natural resource base and all the way forward to the consumers and the public health issues that relate to um, the food choices within the study. And so there's a whole website you can go out to look at for more information. But we wanted to highlight today a couple of those um, um, findings that really dovetail nicely with the themes that Stefan already put together here. And one is this idea of promoting the Colorado brand. We are known nationally as kind of a hip place with whether it's because people connect to our history and heritage of the cowboy culture or our beautiful mountainscapes. 
um, or the fact we have some products like Rocky Ford Melons that have just had high quality in the market for a long time, where there's been a real call for us to leverage that even further. We have a great Colorado Proud program and some other brands you see on here, but we think we've only tapped the, the, the start of the potential for really scaling that up on a national presence um, to build some of those national or even international markets. But we also want to help support the innovation that's happening. As Stefan said, really we've had these gigs and innovators popping up without there being any intended support of them. So then you start thinking about if we actually put some intentional, intentional support behind these people who are looking at new food products that either meet a health, a health goal or a environmental goal, and we nurtured some of those a little more fully, where we might be able to see um, our industries grow even further. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Becca Jablonski to highlight a couple of the very specific things that, um, that um, bubbled up from these conversations that we're actively working on that might be of interest to you. What we wanted to highlight really briefly is exactly what Stefan was talking about, about these assets, right? And that these assets come in many different forms, right? The human capital I mentioned, but it's also in some of these physical things that already exist. So if we look at Northwest Colorado, for example, Right, we actually have a lot of these small scale custom meat processing facilities that emerged as a result of the thriving hunting industry and hunting sector. And so what happened was as demand grew for this grass fed beef, um, there were two of these meat processing facilities in the region that were actually able to become USDA inspected. So that in addition to doing some of the, the processing for the, the hunting industry that they could also help some of these entrepreneurs develop a local label, a private label that could be sold uh, to urban areas where there's a larger customer base, um, as well as in other states, right? So this is taking advantage of an existing asset and thinking about how to connect with other entrepreneurs to scale up and to create jobs in rural places. Um, another example, right, is in Walsh. Uh, so this is Baca County, and we have a grocery store that went out of business, and the community really had nowhere locally to get fresh product um, and so they banded together and were actually able to get this grocery store reopened through leveraging community dollars, right? This is a town with about 500 people in it last time I checked. Um, and they were each able, uh, they got I think over 200 community members to give in some, some small amount of money and to able to reopen this grocery store. And so here you can see again, banding together people who have a shared interest and a uh, shared future to, to try to leverage these existing assets. So I guess what we want to end today with, since we have time for some questions and answers, is what are some of the best ideas from you? And whenever these can implicate Colorado State University, we're happy to try to play a partnership role, but it also can be sharing with us what some of the experiences your community have, how they line up or don't line up with things we've presented today, um, what projects or best practices you worked on that have, have gone particularly well that you might wanna share with the group or not so well. Um, what are the ideas on your community's front burner where either, whether it be CSU or these new regional centers or your community colleges might be able to help you move them forward and um, where, where we could start brainstorming partnerships and combination of regional assets and programming you have out there that could help, we, we could help gel in any way, shape or form. And we're not meaning to overstep our bound because this is a Colorado Trust initiative, but I think part of our goal to be on today wasn't just to tell you everything we, we know, but more importantly, learn some stuff from what you guys know and figure out how it might help guide our future programming. So I guess I'll leave it with that. And I think Tara talked about opening it up so anybody who wanted to talk or ask questions could. And it looks like, oh, it, and it looks like now people are actually able to write in either Q&A or chat. And it looks like we have something from John Rizza. For those of you who are not able to see the chat box, um, John Rizza wrote, recently they conducted a feasibility study for a 200 head a day slaughter and fabrication facility in the Grand Valley. Are there tools to help evaluate the study and help bring this community effort together to make sure it's a good viable option? Um, and so, you know, I think you do have to be careful with these feasibility studies. I've been involved with a number of these, especially in the, the meat processing sector. Um, and there's a number of challenges. One is that I hope this doesn't sound terrible, but a lot of times they're done by um, consultants that have sort of taken similar plans um, and maybe haven't ground truthed it to the extent that they need to, right? Um, so to be really sure and careful about where are they going to get the meat, right? What happens if 
the auctions, for example, are able to jack up the prices uh, that they're going to pay, um, it's unlikely that a new facility is going to have the deep pockets to be able to compete with that. And so you really want to ground truth this and figure out, you know, for the ranchers or the feedlots that may actually use this facility, what does that look like? Are they really committed to do this? Part of that can be done through ownership structure, right? So establishing it as a cooperative is an example would be one way to do this. Um, but I just really think you need to have you know, beyond just making sure the numbers look good, because those to some extent can be replicated, um, you want to make sure that it does have community buy-in. Um, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. My, my one project in this area was with Homestead Meats on the West Slope. And when it comes down to it, uh, you know, we try to be clever in helping them put the numbers together, but without the sheer willpower of the management group that took that on, it wasn't going to happen. So what we always tell people is, you're at a table and there's a conversation about, well, who's going to do this and no one around the table is going to do it. You, you know, it doesn't help at all to have a feasibility study if you don't have someone willing to own it. So I think that's where Stefan's comments about the gig economy come in is usually there's someone already seeding an idea and they've already shown skin in the game by putting tons of man hours and effort into something. We, at least at CSU, are far more interested in bolstering that person and helping them scale up than someone entirely out of the blue coming in and saying, I have a grand idea, we're gonna do this. So John, that's where I don't have the context to know who is behind that study and if there's a set of players who feel like they are ready to put skin in the game, that is an entirely different conversation than if there's just everybody looking around for a solution to their market barrier problem and hoping if they show the numbers are good, someone will just throw money at it. because that's almost akin to the chasing the, the smokestacks and silos concept Stefan did of like, you know, the richest opportunities it looks like in rural areas is for someone there already showing the wherewithal to take something on, helping them grow rather than planting something entirely new there. I, I, I'm not trying to sound harsh, but I think everybody knows what I mean by that. So um, John, um, that, that, that's where if you need to bring us into the conversation, we know that's our role. Yeah, that is exactly true what Don said. And actually, there's been a number of studies that have shown that, you know, the single biggest determinant of success is having the right person at the helm. Um, and so that is that is absolutely key. And the other thing is just going back to the comments I made about making sure that there's buy-in from the community. If you have the right person there, they're going to have the trust of people in the community. So, so one thing we probably short suited, and we're talking about food and agriculture, but you could say this for a lot of sectors, is between the Small Business Administration and the Economic Development Association and U.S. Department of Agriculture programs, there are a lot of resources out there. And probably the, the one clever thing we've seen done with USDA programs, which we're most familiar with, is that um, they almost require some existing business person who has an equity stake in a business to be on the application and so forth. And that's a good best practice. So for those of you who maybe have a hundred ideas floating out there, we would really tell you, put your time and energy behind the ones that have someone who already has a trajectory started that you would be helping grow, rather than someone who's just hatching a new idea. Till they've hatched it a little bit and played around in the space, they're probably just not gonna be ready to gear up. But that's why I think we're, we're trying to start some of these regional centers under CAFE's leadership. And we have like a building farmers program and the SBA has small business programs is just because you might say, no, they're not ready to go after a new million dollar plant, doesn't mean we shouldn't get them in classes and with technical assistance for them to start hatching their ideas. Any other questions? I mean, I guess we also would love for people to share and talk about in your work that Tara introduced at the very start of this, where you've seen some barriers or opportunities pop up, you weren't exactly sure how to handle, and if there's any place we can provide some support or context. Well, in the meantime, let me make a bigger invitation um, on behalf of Stefan. Um, so the Regional Economic Development Institute is a very young, burgeoning institute. Two things I think we would say. First, for these slides, we kind of put them together to zip through today, but also if, it, if any of them serve you guys' purposes in a presentation you're gonna give or a grant you're gonna write or a program you're gonna propose, as long as you cite where they came from, and sometimes it's just citing us as an institute, but you'll see other places we cite the demographer's office or Bureau of Labor Statistics, you are welcome to use any of those slides for any purpose that supports your programming. And then secondly, 
um, we're really trying to map out a scope of work for that institute that um, serves the state well. And we anchored in topics we have had a history in because we know them best. And you could tell from today that's entrepreneurship and um, food, food and agriculture for sure. But we also have partners coming online from across the campus that if it's in another area and we can help help you, even if it can't help you immediately, we can start planning our work or getting people and partners so we can we can do a better job. That's That's our goal with the webinar today. Great, thank you for that. And we encourage you to take a look at, at our website, ready.colostate.edu. Um, we already have, a, we have some background information, our six core areas, ready reports. Um, we're actually gonna have this presentation on the, uh, on the website post relatively soon too. Um, again, don't hesitate to contact us with any questions from, from the presentation. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It looks like Paula's group might be ready to ask a question. Is there funding? available for entrepreneuring in this area? There is. The type varies a lot. We know the agricultural program is much better than, than other programs, but we've been trying to develop more relationships with the Small Business Administration. I would say less maybe, we know less about the, the funding than the programming they have, but we would tell anybody your first good step into getting funding is to go to some of the workshops and programming those organizations who offer the funding have so you know you're designing your plan of action in a way that follows the best practices of what they're recommending. So definitely connect with the Small Business Administration. Well, what area are you in, if you don't mind sharing? The San Luis Valley. Oh, and just one other suggestion too, which is that um, U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development has a number of different programs. A lot of theirs are focused on infrastructure, right? So if there's specific places, they have something called a community facilities grant as an example. Um, and so once you have your idea developed, um, you know, when we'd be happy to connect you with the rural development people in your area, they can help to sit down and see if some of those programs um, do have support for you. But I will say, especially the federal programs, they really do require a lot of work. And it's not just work in writing the grant, it's work in administering the grant. So a lot of times um, those programs are better applied for through some kind of nonprofit or government entity, um, but you can still work with those entities to support individual private entrepreneurs. Or, or, or following up on what Stefan said before, maybe one individual, let's say someone's on Etsy and they're starting to make um, Western heritage pillows or interior design materials for people. Probably one person like that couldn't go to these, but if you had a series of people who are trying to develop a whole brand or a whole um, notion of coming from the high mountains in San Luis Valley, that's I think there's these rural business enterprise programs where you can actually have then some professionals who have business skills come in and help people put, put together a real plan of action so that I would say they're never going to kind of come and just buy you a, a shop. But what they want to do is share the risk of if you're going to start a business, they'll take some of that risk off of you by putting some of the startup resources you would need to build that concept. Um, they'll, they'll put them in for you and share some of that risk with you. I think that's how rural development would like to think of it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. There's a, there's a small business development centers you might know in Alamosa. Um, and so, and then there's also the, uh, the San Luis Valley Development Resources Group. Um, and they have, a, they, have a number of, they have a number of pieces on their website that might be useful too. They have a number of links to funding organizations. But perhaps what I'm also hearing is in, as we develop the Institute website, we could have a clearinghouse of just some examples of the types of funding people have gotten. And if they're willing to share even what an example of their application materials might have been to secure that, just because I agree with you guys, sometimes I, you just don't know what you don't know. But if you can visually see how another community used those resources, it helps um, fuel the fire of what you might be able to do in your own place. Would that be helpful? I have a, do you have to be part of this particular community to get involved or like with the businesses, the, the thing in almost of it is it again? No, no, no. That's uh, yeah, the, small business, the small business center in Alamosa? Yeah, it's dedicated to the whole valley. 
It covers the whole region. It covers the whole region. Generally, those will show up in places like Alamosa, the largest town in a region, but they, they, are, they are designed to cover the entire region. But there's all, again, the San Luis Valley Development Resources Group, um, they, have, they have a number of other local partnerships too. But, but I think you guys are illuminating the fact we kind of renew is there is a, a, a maze of resources out there to navigate. And perhaps we could even make like a little decision tree of like, if this is the kind of thing you're trying to grow in your community, these would be the first couple of agencies to talk to. And, and, and Kathy, again, speak up if you're still online about if that's something the centers are trying to do. But we, we are definitely looking for ways we can make it easier for you guys to find find things. Because sometimes we, we and we've been around forever, I feel like older than a tree. Um, and we had just learned that there was something we didn't know about. So it must be really hard for those of you who this is a relatively new concept for. Yes. Very helpful. Thank you. I will be in your area. Um, I'm going to be coming down for the meeting with the potato growers in February. If you have any interest in trying to meet while um, I'm down there, I would be happy to do that. So um, we could get in touch. I'm, if you go to Ready there. Right, yeah. You can, uh, you can find contact, contact us. Information. Yeah, you can find contact information. Yeah. I have a direct link also to her, um, to her on the website too. Yeah. And, and BB and I will also be responsible. We'll send a follow up email to everybody who registered and we'll make sure we send contact information. I'll also be sending a little form for you to fill out feedback for the survey. So we'll send that um, all together. Just for your information, there's a group of us that registered, but we only came on through, we met as a group. So it's just not me, it's Lorena Tencio, Jay Warner, Ellis Canby, and Miranda. Thanks so much for introducing. We didn't take the time to introduce the people in the room, so thank you for that. Other we questions keep, from communities? Yeah, we don't want to keep people too long, but, you know, again, an invitation that even in, in, the, in the future, if there's anything you want to do, we, we wanted you to know about us and and know that our institute existed. We wish we could promise turnaround in seven days and we'll try to get better, but um, we, we promise you, your request won't go unnoticed. Fantastic. I have a question. Um, what are some of the first steps that um, communities can take to assess the strengths and local resources that can maybe translate to new business startups or even potential startups or identify um, identify areas that we could maybe look into? That's a really good question. So the question for people who didn't hear it is, what would be the, op, the, the most effective first steps to try to identify where some of those key opportunities are? Um, again, with, with Ready, we're hoping to start a process where we can actually have communities apply to actually get some very targeted assistance to come in and do exactly that for you. Um, but again, we never want to be the person leading that. We want to be the technical assistant up alongside an, an, an organization that might be a chamber of commerce. For some people, it's been a tourism association. For some people, um, you know, it, it might be a health district. So I think what you'd want to first do, even before you approach, whether it's us or a USDA agency or your community college, is figure out who are the key players you'd want to bring to, together that would at least own part of that. And I know that's a really hard thing to say, but you know you know how to canvas that set of group of people better than we would. Because um, sometimes we look a little presumptive walking into a community because we're not going to be living there every day to operationalize it. So we need the people who are. But I would say um, if you could pull if you pull together what are key players. You know, that's where you should approach uh, us at CSU or your community college and stuff for assistance. Very few communities of a small size in a rural area are going to have the capacity to do that alone. But even if we can't do as big or thorough of a job as we can, we know the partners who would actually have the capacity to help you with that, including our extension agents, which are in every county of the state, but we only have a subset of them who've really taken on a community uh, and development role. But we, we would do our best to help you. So I, I would say that, I'd say what we're gonna be good at is putting some of the data points together for you, plus coming up with some really quick and effective ways you could gather very ground level grassroots data about, like you said, how do we know who these gigs are and where, where they're coming from? I think we could think of some pretty creative ways to try to 
either do some data scraping off the web or some kind of community engagement process that might have those people come up um, out of the um, woodwork. Um, and again, I think we need to talk to you. I don't think, unfortunately, there's not a good cookbook here because it would totally depend on the nature of the community, how far apart people are, what, what, whether there's a major driving city versus if it's a pretty um, sparsely populated rural area. So um, I guess I just said the first step is to maybe give us a call and, and have us try to put the right people alongside your team. And I just want to um, also add to that, that I think, um, you know, as Don said, obviously getting the right people in the room is really important. Um, but then trying to figure out those assets that you do have in the community and getting the right people in the room is basically those human assets, right? The human capital assets. Um, but then also thinking about some of that, those physical assets. And I think as that story about the meat processing illustrates, sometimes people don't think broadly enough about what those assets might be, right? So it could be the fact that, you know, you have some um, unutilized space in your community. It could be, we have an example of someone um, here in the Fort Collins area that started a company where she's tried to map, uh, match entrepreneurs with um, underutilized kitchen space, right? And she's found pizzerias, for example, that may not be using their kitchen, right, which is inspected during certain hours of the day. And so entrepreneurs can get started in those areas. And so getting those, the right people together and then thinking about, I think, mapping some of those assets so that you can figure out, okay, what are the strengths in this community can be a great place to start. There was a question I, I saw in the, the chat box that Greg had a question from Olathe, but we did not uh, yeah. hear him yet, I don't think. Sure, this is Greg Davidson from Olathe. I just had a question about maybe uh, discussing more of the opportunities to do or, or what we might do around broadband access in our communities. Did you just, I didn't see any discussion about that in the presentation. Well, well, we, 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 none of us have directly worked on it. The two things I can tell you is all signals from the United States Department of Agriculture are that rural broadband support is going to get a significant chunk of resources thrown at it. And two, I was just at a conference with Representative Sonnenberg from Colorado and his key piece of legislation he's putting forth in the Ag, Ag Committee this year is going to be on using um, high cost fund funding to actually support broadband. I guess we flip it the other way as you would use some of this information on the importance of gig economy in your areas as a way for you to justify and get first in line to get access to that money to show you have evidence now that could be a major leveling of the playing field for how competitive your community is. But the good news we have from you is both at the federal and state level, it is clear there's going to be more broadband money coming online. There are people who still forget there are pockets of this country that don't have broadband. Um, right. But again, you need to be, the more you can do as a community to have a really, really engaged conversation about what does that look like? Are we just gonna leave that hand in the hands of our cable provider to add? Or is there some community ownership solution that would make it that um, you maintain some control over that. Because what I've heard from the Midwest um, with people who do work on this is that it's always that one or 2% or pockets of areas that just don't ever get covered that are the real problem. In the mountainous Colorado region, that That's is problem. gonna be a problem. If it's a cable provider, they are gonna always be running numbers for what makes sense. If it's a community-based solution, it's far more likely you're gonna have some compassion about making it to every little pocket of your community. So what I would tell you is make it happen. If you really need to turn to the big players like the cable companies, but if there's any way your community could consider a solution, like we in Fort Collins just voted to have um, community broadband as a community asset, just like a utility for electricity. I think it's a good time to have that conversation. Right, I mean, think about, I mean, I think the idea here is also to go to current business leaders um, and ask them, I mean, what, what what kind of, you know, what would broadband do for you? What, how would it expand your market? What kind of market could you hit? I mean, given the fact that you've gotten good at, I mean, I know you folks are great at corn, for instance, right? Um, but I mean, other things, I mean, how can, how can we use that to expand our, our pitch, our message, our niche? Um, because my sense is that you probably have two or three or four folks that probably could leverage it pretty quickly to get into even a regional or statewide or, you know, sort of Western US market. Um, so think about what how the kind of opportunities that will open up for people who are already there and are doing something pretty interesting and successful. 
-hmm. And for Olathe, that might even be a tourism pitch. Absolutely. I mean, because when people are visiting that area, they expect their phone to work wherever they are. You know, we've always added these taxes to, you know, our, our hotels or other tourism assets to, you know, cover roads. Maybe it's time we start thinking about a tax that covers, you know, broadband support. Because again, I, I, I'd hazard a guess, but there's probably times a year that 20% of your wireless could be, be used by be, be used by people outside of your community. Well, then they should they, they should help pay for it, right? And so some of your lodging facilities might even be interested in taking a lead on this because it makes a difference for their visitors whether they have good coverage, quote unquote, or not. And I mean, I, I know, for example, I mean, having visited down there a couple of times, I mean, you guys have some great wineries down there, for instance, too, right? People don't yeah. recognize, I mean, they don't, they don't, I mean, you folks should be on par close to Grand Junction in Mesa County in that respect. I mean, it's a question of just, you know, thinking about broadband as a way to get your message out. Thank you. I appreciate it. Don, is there a place, um, a resource you could recommend looking to for examples of what other communities have done around community ownership models? I know you mentioned, I think, did you say Fort Collins? Um, are there, do you know if there's any examples of rural communities that have, that have uh, been successful in that? In the community ownership model of mm -hmm. broadband? Of, of broadband. Mm -hmm. um, let us make that a goal. I, we know them anecdotally, but that would be a really interesting fact sheet. Let us actually figure out if we can um, have one of our research associates compile some of that, because again, some of that information was put together for, for Collins, but I know we were mimicking Longmont. My concern is that those are two pretty big cities, so I think we're going to try to hunt down whether we can find some smaller rural areas too that don't have the wherewithal of a, a Fort Collins that can also show it. So let, let me make that as a goal, and of course, we'll make sure we get it back to you when we release it. But I think that'd be a very good document for us to develop. Awesome. Yeah, Thank awesome. you. Thank you for that idea. Any other questions? We have just a few more minutes left. Well, I will... Um, like I said, BB and I will send, up a send out a follow-up email to everybody who attended today's webinar um, with um, contact information for our speakers so that you can follow up directly with them. And I want to pitch our next um, webinars, but I will um, direct you to the Colorado Trust website for our next webinar, which will be um, Thursday, January 11th um, at 2.30, and it will be with the CareerWise Youth Apprenticeship Model. Ashley Carter and Hollis Salway from CareerWise will be sharing about that program. And then this Friday, January 12th, we'll have Brian Watson from Pro Proximity Space, who will be making the case for co-working as a way of promoting entrepreneurship and social connection within rural areas. And then we also have three more coming the following week. So they're coming fast and furious. Um, because we know how um, fully in this planning process communities are and how urgent this um, it is for you to have some inspiration and ideas for possible solutions. So um, just wanted to share that. And again, you can go to the Colorado Trust website to sign up for all of those just like you did for this. And it, um, those two will be available. The recordings will be available on our website. Okay. Thank you so much um, to everyone, to our um, presenters, to all the people who participated and shared your ideas and questions. Um, unless there's anything else, I think we'll go ahead and close.